Hey, what is up you guys? This is Paul and in this video is what I want to do is show you guys how you can use Spire's reverb in any other synth on any bus channel or on any audio without being tied to the reverb unit built with Inspire. And this is actually something that you can use to take the built-in reverb on any synthesizer that you want and use it in kind of as a free reverb plugin. And the way we're going to be doing this is using convolution reverb and recording an impulse response. So before we get started, this is me recording after I made this video, I want to actually compare the signal or the, the sound with the Spires reverb and with the sort of simulated reverb that I've made using um, this impulse response. So here's the original reverb. And here is the other version and notice how the reverb's muted. Now the process for Spire, and Spire is probably the only virtual analog synthesizer that's gonna make it this difficult, actually requires a few extra steps. Whereas most other virtual analog synthesizers, this is a super easy process. But, uh, and I'll explain why Spire is a little bit more difficult in a second. So the other day when I found this out, I, was, I had this trance pluck and I really liked the way the reverb sounded. And I wanted to recreate this in certain other reverbs, so I tried Arts Acoustic and a few others, and those are fantastic reverbs, but I just didn't have the exact sound that this did, and I really liked the way this sounded, and I would have wanted to put this reverb on the bus channel. So the way that I figured out how to do this is, what we're gonna do is we're gonna duplicate this channel. So there's another one, whoops. And I'm gonna call this, I, whoops, IR, and I'm gonna give it the color pink. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna turn off pretty much every single thing that there is here, every option there is. So I'm gonna turn off pretty much all the oscillators. I'm gonna turn off the filter, I'm gonna turn off the EQ, although you don't necessarily have to turn off the EQ. Definitely turn off the compressor and all of the plugins, or all the effects, sorry, except for the reverb. And with oscillator four, and you don't have to use oscillator four, you can use any oscillator. What we wanna do is choose noise. And we wanna to try to pick a as I guess close to a flat spectra as we can. So if I take this down and now I get EQ um, eight, actually let me do it this way. Cool, here it is. And we'll just. So as you can see um, here in the in the frequency domain, it looks flat. Now this is actually, and the difficult thing about Spire is this is actually pink noise. This isn't white noise. Now most people know of white noise as having sort of equal power spectrum across different frequencies, and that's true. But the reason that it looks flat when this is pink noise is because this is the frequency range is logarithmic, and as a result, they're being binned logarithmically. So it's actually <laughs> it looks flat because of the way that because of the slope. So pink noise actually has a power spectral density of one over F. Now remember that one over F curve for later on because it's going to come back to bite us. But for now, what we need to do is we want to actually record this impulse response. So I'm going to insert a new audio track and make sure it's receiving audio from the impulse response. And I'm going to insert a new MIDI clip where I'm going to try to make an impulse, which is this noise played for as short as possible. So take a listen. And the thing we also need to do is make sure the reverb is 100% wet. That may actually be a little too short. <laughs> That's fine. So once again, a really short note, you can't have it so short that it gets cut off or anything like that, you need to allow it to, to play. Actually, the reason this probably is doing it is because I have attack and release. If I had this down, all the, the attack down. That's probably better. Okay, so let me do that and I'm gonna arm this track for recording and I'm gonna hit the record button. And I just wanna make sure this dies out completely before we stop the recording. Cool, so here's our impulse response. Now, if you are using any other synthesizer that allows you to use white noise, you can just take this 
and just skip the next step. You can use this directly in any convolution reverb plugin. But unfortunately for Spire, there is, there's only pink noise. So we have to account for the fact that the power spectrum of or the impulse response, or sorry, the power spectrum of the impulse response is slanted as um, one over F, which we need to correct for. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna find, show this in Finder and I'm gonna copy this impulse response and I'm gonna bring it over to, and I'm just doing this to make it easy to this MATLAB script that I have. And I'm gonna call this ir.aif just so I know. And within MATLAB, I have this sort of, this easy script that is what it's gonna do here is I'm gonna load in ir.aif, which is this guy, and I'm gonna resave it as pluck verb. So basically, usually this would just be the source name. And what this ends up doing is this reads in the data, it, and then it ends up performing a fractional derivative on the signal in the time domain. So it's actually, it's like a half derivative. It's really a bizarre thing. But what that corresponds to doing is if we think about what's going on here, when we have a signal whose power spectral density is one over F, that actually is like filtering the signal. We can think of it as filtering the signal with some, um, actual filter of one over the square root of F. And that's applied kind of forwards and backwards to cause the power spectral density to fall off as one over F. And the way we invert one over F is multiplying by F, which corresponds to a kind of a scaled derivative in the frequency domain. So to counteract the actual one over square root of F in the actual spectral of the signal, we're gonna be multiplying by the square root of F, which is taking a fractional derivative because this is of course done in the time domain, um, whereas instead of, of doing this in the, in the frequency domain. And in fact, the actually the way that I'm doing this is taking this into the time domain and scaling it according to the square root of F accounting for the sampling frequency and all those things. Um, but this is taking a fractional derivative. Originally I had done this as a regular derivative and I forgot that the power spectral density isn't necessarily the same as the spectra uh, behavior wise. And I was getting too much low frequency content because I was inverting for something that was, or accounting for something that was I guess double, so yeah, don't do that. Um, but luckily you can just run the script and you don't really have to understand all the technical details here. So the next thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take this pluck now that we've sort of corrected this, this impulse response here. Um, let me just run it, there it goes. And I'm gonna go over here and duplicate this and I'm gonna call this transpluck dry. And what I'm gonna do here instead is I'm gonna mute the reverb and I'm gonna bring in my own reverb that I recorded. Now with this, you, at this point, you can use any convolution reverb you want. I've been a really big fan of Fog Convolver. It has a really nice interface and it's really easy to use and it's only about $60. Most digital audio workstations come with one. In Live, there's a Max, some Max for Live devices. In FL Studio, there's Fruity Convolver, which is fantastic. And there's also some pretty popular ones like AltaVerb, which is really expensive and Waves IRL or IR1, which I've used quite a bit as well. So now that we have this is what I need to do is I need to find where that, where I recorded my impulse response. And I have the script save it into this, this folder here, which is basically under impulse responses. And I called this pluck verb. This guy, drag it in here, make sure it's all ready to go. And I don't know why it did that. And this is the thing, in order to get it to sound the same, we need to account for the fact that when we recorded this impulse response, we needed to have it 100% wet. So we need to just match the volume to the original signal. So as you can hear, it's pretty close. Now it's not gonna be exactly the same. And the reason for that is in Spire, the reverb, the signal that is coming out of all the effects, including the reverb is sent through the EQ. And it's also sent through this multiband compressor here that really does shape the sound. And this in particular is really what's gonna change the way the, these things sound because you're multiband compressing the signal and the reverb together. But if you like kind of the general tonal characteristics of the reverb, I would say you can get this to a point where you probably can't tell the difference between both of them, unless it's a particular sound that's using this, this X compressor a lot. And if that's the case, you can probably just use like a normal multiband compressor 
anyway outside of it, like um, Xvers OTT or something like that, and get that similar sound. Because a lot of times in a lot with these sounds, we're applying compression on the reverb anyway to sort of flatten out the dynamics and make sure it's not it doesn't get too overpowering when the synth and reverb are playing at the same time. Um, so yeah. Hope you guys found this helpful. Be sure to leave a like, leave a comment if you have any questions or anything. And uh, yeah, thanks for stopping by.